good to go. All right, so I'd first like to uh, introduce um, one of, I'm sure everybody in the, on the Zoom room knows who she is, but uh, definitely one of our co-founding members and a name that we all know, Pedro Schultz, and I would like to ask her to bring our land acknowledgement and greetings from the Board of Directors for Mom Stop the Harm, Petra. Thank you, Tyla, and welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to begin tonight by acknowledging the Indigenous people of all the lands that we are on today. While we meet on the virtual pl platform, let us take the moment to acknowledge, acknowledge the impact of the, um, the importance of the lands we each call home. We affirm our commitment and responsibility to care for the lands, to strengthen relationships between nations, to improve our understanding of local Indigenous people, their unique histories, homelands, languages, cultural practices, and spiritual beliefs. From coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral, ceded and unceded territories of First Nations people, Inuit, Nanangat, the Métis homeland of First Nations, Inuit and Métis people call these lands home. Uh, please join me in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and to consider how we each in our own way move forward in a respectful and meaningful spirit of reconciliation. Oh. I personally today come to you from um, the uh, uh, Treaty 7 territory, which is the homeland of the, the Blackfoot Nation um, in, Calgary, in and around Calgary. Uh, please, um, if you would like, you can introduce yourself in the chat by typing your name and um, by, um, if you like, um, acknowledging the land you are on. Uh, next, I'd like to greet you on behalf of our board of directors. Um, we have this uh, um, Holding Hope Connect series ongoing, and um, Antoinette in a bit will tell us a bit more about um, our Stronger Together Canada programs and Holding Hope. But as a board, uh, we are really pleased uh, to have this topic tonight, um, uh, safer supplies, is something that is very, very important to us, one of the key um, uh, goals that we are working on right now is the decriminalization of people who use but we understand that the decriminalization alone does not change the toxic supply so it has to be really supply uh, combined with safer supply and i'm excited uh, i'm excited to hear um so sorry we have some people who are not not muted so i um i think we have a few board members here tonight um i'd like to introduce so, checking if Leslie is in the house, if he could give us a wave, Leslie um, McBean is our other co-founder. Um, I'm sure we have Angela here. Angela Wells uh, from Edmonton looks after much of our social media. Um, is Arlene here, Arlene Kolb um, from Winnipeg. Uh, part of our uh, uh, Manitoba team, and they just had a really powerful event there, laying flowers on the steps of the legislature. Um, uh, Willie is from Saskatchewan, um, and um, Emily is our representative uh, from Atlant for Atlantic Canada. So welcome to those who are able to join. Um, and um, yeah, then I'd like to hand it over to um, Tyler again, and I will be introducing our speaker in a moment. Thanks, Petra. All right, so I'd like to introduce my cohort and I guess, you know, partner in crime as far as our Stronger Together Canada um, team. So Antoinette um, Gravel Ulet is, uh, like I said, is our is my partner in crime and we work together to uh, bring you the Stronger Together Canada program. And her title within our program is Stronger Together Program Coordinator. So she's gonna give us an overview and some further, further introductions. Go ahead, please, Antoinette. Thanks, Tyla. Um, so I am the um, program coordinator for Stronger Together Canada. And for those of you that don't know, Stronger Together, there's a Stronger Together BC team. Um, I did see Kareen come in. I'm not sure if people, Kareen, if you can unmute and just say hi. Um, we've got so many different screens here. I think we've got three screens. So Kareen is the Stronger Together BC Holding Hope Coordinator for BC. Um, and also, I don't know if Helen came on, but um, Helen is the um, Stronger Together BC Facilitator Coordinator, and she was going to be joining us tonight. 
Um, and so we have two programs that are in the Stronger Together program. Um, we have Stronger Together BC, which started initially in BC and received some funding, funding from the BC government um, to start those programs there of Healing Hearts and Holding Hope. And this past spring, um, we received some funding from the federal government for a SUAP grant, with, which is Substance Use and Addictions. And um, they have graciously funded us for two years to roll out Holding Hope and Healing Hearts across Canada. Holding Hope is a group for those um, families that have a loved one still struggling with substances. And, um, and Healing Hearts are for families that have had a loved one pass due to substance related deaths. Um, and so we're rolling those out across Canada and um, all the provinces, still working on Quebec though. And um, so if you're interested in any of those programs, you can contact myself or Tyla or go to our, our webpage and there's contact information there. Um, thank you. Awesome, thanks Antoinette. All right, so the process that we're gonna go through tonight is we're gonna give Corey some time to just give us some information and really get the conversation started. Um, so about 10 minutes or so, and then we're going to um, start taking questions. So with it being to have some organization to the chaos that we have going on with such a large crowd, which is fantastic to see, we're gonna ask that you please put your questions or your comments in the chat window. And then that way we can uh, you know, coordinate the getting the information to Corey and um, you know, just have some process to the whole, to the whole uh, program tonight. So you can already start putting your questions in if you like, if we find that it's been answered or that, yeah, that's similar to another question, then I'll be pulling those together and we'll give that to Corey. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back to uh, Petra and she's going to introduce our awesome speaker tonight, Corey. Thank you. Corey, again, is somebody who um, needs very little introduction. Corey's a strong voice um, and a strong advocate, a professional um, uh, who has been working in the safe supply and harm reduction field for some time. Now he's a clinical nurse lead of AID, for AIDS Vancouver Island uh, Safe Supply Project, Victoria Safer Initiative. And he's also the president of um, the Canadian Harm Reduction Nurses Association. Um, and he's um, on the board of directors of HIV Legal Network. So, and he is a dad and a husband, so a very, very busy man. And we are thankful that he makes time for us. Um, Corey, while he lives in Victoria, to me is an honorary Albertan. Um, he was to lead a consumption site in the city of Medicine Hat in Southern Alberta, um, which unfortunately was one of the first things the Alberta government chopped and with that Corey's job. But Corey still continues to support our efforts in Alberta and helps us um, with uh, really good information and resources and we, we really appreciate that. So, so I pass it over to Corey and I'm happy that he likes our format. So don't be shy. Um, Corey um, uh, is happy to chat about safer supply and there are a lot of challenges around safer supply. It's not, it's not easy and it's not doing quite what, it's, what we all hoped it would do. So let's have those conversations. Corey, to you. All right, everyone, can you okay? Great. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Petra. Really excited to be able to talk to everybody today and to have these conversations. Uh, I'm absolutely 100% open to having conversation for people to ask questions um, and, and just know for folks that when we talk about safe supply, when we talk about what's working and what's not working, why is it not accessible to people? Um, we're gonna talk about some challenging subjects and they might make you feel uncomfortable. I'm gonna say some things about medicine in general, about paternalism, about the ways that people are controlled and the ways that programs are made inaccessible. And I want us all to be able to have these tough conversations uh, and to learn uh, from all of the work that has already been done and is already underway by many people, not just myself. Um, I also want my PowerPoint to work, fantastic. So I started off with this quote here, uh, just to kind of set the table. And um, this is from our community engagement project that our Safe Supply Project engaged in right at the onset of the Safe Supply Project. 
Uh, and this is a quote from one of the people who were helping us understand what we needed to take into consideration when it came in when it came to developing a safe supply model. And that quote is, remember that ultimately when people use drugs, they generally want it to be a fun and enjoyable experience while they're using them. Any barriers to the actual enjoyment of the substances are barriers to people using the program. And this is really at the crux of what's wrong with safe supply right now, is that truly, and here comes the first challenging thing I'm going to say, uh, where we haven't really done safe supply yet. Uh, we can't declare safe supply a failure because it doesn't exist yet. We're, we're trying to get there, but the models that it's being delivered through, the way that it's being delivered, um, the way that it's being framed uh, is, is problematic and it creates barriers to access. And so we haven't yet acknowledged the fact that people need a safe supply, not just because they want to avoid feeling sick or avoid feeling withdrawal. People want a safe supply because they take drugs for many, many reasons. And unless programs and initiatives are designed acknowledging that people use drugs for fun, for enjoyment, for pain relief, for many, many reasons, uh, we're never actually going to see much progress in this uh, type of initiative. Before I move any further, uh, I do want to acknowledge uh, that the work that I do, the work that the Safer Victoria Initiative does, uh, is on stolen Lekwungen territory. There is a link between colonization, which is fundamentally a process of violence and disconnection that operates at many levels, and the topics we're here to discuss today, namely the war on drugs, uh, which is a war on people and is rooted in racism and colonization. A land acknowledgement is not even remotely enough when it comes to eliminating these structural and historical barriers, but it is one small step towards a relationship of humility and collaboration. I'm incredibly privileged and grateful to be uh, working on Lekwungen and Wasainich lands, and I live at the intersections of the Cowichan tribe and the Malahat First Nations, uh, and I'm grateful to do so. I also want to make sure that I'm acknowledging the work of people with lived and living experience of criminalized drug use. Truly, we wouldn't have seen much progress in responding to the overdose crisis and responding to the ever toxic drug supply if it weren't for people with lived and living experience assuming the most risk when nobody else would. When health authorities and governments should have acted quickly, they didn't. And so people with lived and living experience of drug use, they came out to support each other and to, to keep their communities alive. They did so in the form of needle exchange programs, take home naloxone programming, supervised consumption services, and now safe supply. And it's without them that if they, if they weren't doing this work, if they weren't sharing their experiences and they're sharing their knowledge, None of the work that I do would exist. Many of us wouldn't be able to uh, do the work that we do and to be able to provide the information that we do. Now, I, this is not necessarily for people to jump in and start telling us how you're feeling, but it is a moment of reflection. And so uh, I do wanna kind of frame this whole conversation around um, the fact that we're all coming to this conversation from very different places. There's a confluence of emotions that we're feeling on a daily basis, especially if you are impacted by the toxic drug supply, which all of us in one way, shape or form are. And so today I'm joining you and I'm actually, I'm feeling a little bit uh, frustrated and I'm feeling a little bit challenged today. Um, we continue to do as much work as we can to try and innovate and push forward for a safe supply. Uh, and yet we're also being met with a lot of stigmatizing rhetoric about safe supply. And there's a lot of people with power and the ability to uh, improve access to a safe supply who are actually spending their time disparaging it and are spending their time, uh, you know, relying on anecdotes and rhetoric in order to discredit safe supply. And that's really unfortunate. And it, it's it's challenging to deal with. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that all of you may be coming to this conversation in a different way uh, and feeling different things. And that's totally okay. If you ever find that the conversation that we're having is too intense or that it is uh, too close to home, it's always okay to step away and it's always okay to take a break. So what are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna frame safe supply around harm reduction because uh, Safe supply belongs with harm reduction. It doesn't, it doesn't belong in medicine. It doesn't belong in uh, traditional models that we've seen. And so it's important that we reflect on the principles of harm reduction when we're talking about a safe supply. 
so that we can understand what we actually need to do in order to see meaningful uh, and effective safe supply initiatives. Uh, we're going to talk about safe supply. We're going to talk about the basics of safe supply. Uh, and we're going to talk about what's wrong with safe supply right now. We're going to talk about um, BC's current approach to safe supply, the BC risk mitigation guidance documents, uh, how the pandemic has changed the drug supply and how evolving drug tolerances are impacting our ability to keep pace uh, and to provide an effective intervention. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the work that we do here in Victoria with the Victoria Safer Initiative. A little bit about myself and not an introduction like Pedro did, I'll say that uh, I'm incredibly passionate about this work and this is all, all that I do. And so um, if it sounds like I'm, I'm, you know, if it sounds like I'm passionate about this work, if it sounds like maybe I'm feeling frustrated with the way that things are right now, it's because, because I am, because we actually know the solutions to these problems. We need to spend more time listening to people who use drugs and actually asking them what they need. And when they tell us, we need to follow through on it and actually act on it. And that's not something that's happening right now. And there continues to be tokenizing of people who use drugs. Uh, and because of that, we continue to see failed initiatives being implemented and rolled out. And as all of you are well aware, we continue to experience the worst version of this overdose crisis here in BC, but also abroad in so-called Canada. Uh, BC declared a public health emergency over the toxic drug supply over five years ago, and we're just now experiencing the worst versions of this crisis. Uh, in August of 2021, 181 British Columbians died by toxic drug death, uh, and that was the highest ever on record for an August in BC. And in September, 152 people died by drug toxicity, and that was the highest ever for a September on record as well. In the first nine months of 2021, 1,534 British Columbians have died by overdose, and 5.5 British Columbians are dying every single day on average. What's really awful, uh, I mean, all of this is really awful, is that 71% of those dying are age 30 to 59. Uh, and what that means is this continues to be a crisis that is truly impacting an entire generation of people and, and is really carving out and cutting a clean swath through that generation. Now, uh, what we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about today is safe supply accessibility and why isn't it accessible? What is the current issue with safe supply? Uh, and there's so much chatter about safe supply in BC. One would think that there's a lot of people who are on a safe supply, uh, but the truth is that the biggest problem with safe supply is that it's not accessible. Uh, it's not available to those who need it and available in the ways that people need it. Of the 90,000 British Columbians at risk of overdose, uh, 3,329 of them have been successful in accessing a safe supply, which works out to less than 4% of those who need it or those who would benefit from it uh, have actually been able to access it. And then the version of the safe supply that they are accessing is problematic into itself as well. I'll explain a little bit about the history of safe supply here in BC as it pertains to the pandemic. Uh, I was working in the homeless encampments in Victoria when uh, the pandemic uh, first started to take hold here in, in British Columbia, and I had actually taken a leave of absence from my, from my project management job to start supporting some of the work in the parks because there was such a great need and there was very few resources that were provided to support the work in the parks uh, to the point where we had up to 250 tents at one point in time. Uh, and people still didn't have access to clean drinking water. Uh, and so when we were working there, what we also saw was a radical change in the drug supply, and it wasn't uh, anticipated quick enough. And what happened was from a macro level, border closures disrupted supply chains, but then from a smaller scale, what we saw in Victoria and we saw basically in, in every major municipality was a quick reduction of services available to people. Uh, people who are accessing shelters, people who are accessing overdose prevention services or supervised consumption services, suddenly those sites were either closed or restricted or there was a service disruption. And so there was a big push of people uh, who were no longer able to access some of those vital essential services all at one point in time. And then from the more 
individual scale, uh, people were being That's told different. people were being told to isolate. People were being told to quarantine. People were being told to, to keep their distances from one another. And what that also meant was that isolation was high. And so when we add a change in the drug supply, a reduction in life-saving services and an increase in isolation, what we have is the perfect storm for an increase in overdose deaths. And we saw that firsthand in the parks in April of 2020 over check week, we had 28 overdoses in the week and we had seven of them uh, in one day and actually ran out of naloxone on the last overdose. And that was also the introduction of benzo dope here in BC. So we started to see more complex overdoses. Uh, the drug supply wasn't just fentanyl, it was fentanyl with a tizolam or fentanyl with a different benzodiazepine, which is a type of sedative. And when used in combination with, over, with opioids, it can be very uh, dangerous for people, especially because they don't have any tolerance. They've never been, they haven't been taking that drug. Uh, and we also saw an increase in the concentration of fentanyl. Uh, it was estimated that pre-pandemic, the average amount of uh, average concentration of fentanyl on the street was around six to eight percent. And then they started seeing samples coming in with concentrations of 24 to 32 percent. Uh, and a recent presentation from the Vancouver Island Drug Checkers, also called Substance, uh, which I highly recommend having them come on and talk about the, the poison drug supply and, and what's going on with the drug supply right now. Uh, they estimate that when people say they use one point of, of down on the streets, one point of opiates, uh, which is 0.1 uh, gram, they are actually taking somewhere between 390 and 1480 milligrams of morphine in that one dose. Uh, and if they're using five points a day, which is actually quite average, that equates to somewhere around 1950 to 7400 milligrams of, of morphine in one in in one day. Uh, and so what that means is the more use that's happening with this concentrated supply, the more people's tolerances are going up. And when their tolerances are going up, that means our traditional options for safe supply become less and less effective. Uh, because it's not able to meet their needs. It's not able, fentanyl is not the same as, as hydromorphone or any of those types of drugs. Uh, and so it's important context to understand this because if we don't have a safe supply that is comparable to what people are taking on the street in some way, shape or form, it's never going to be effective. Now in the context of BC's risk mitigation guidance documents, uh, BC released this document uh, right at the end of March, and it basically, for, for many of us, we thought that that meant safe supply had finally arrived, and we were really excited about it. Uh, pardon me. We were really excited. We thought we actually had something that was going to help. Uh, and what we quickly learned was that it was a very problematic first introduction to safe supply. Uh, and that it was being framed and linked to the wrong pieces that we needed. What that means is that when BC released their risk mitigation guidance documents, they actually made it a tool that was meant to mitigate the harms of COVID-19, not a tool that was meant to mitigate the harms of the toxic drug supply. What the belief was, was that people who use drugs were going to get sick with COVID and they were going to need to isol isolate. And while they were isolating, they wouldn't be able to access their regular supply, which means they would start to go through withdrawal. And so they created a tool that would allow prescribers to prescribe an amount of Dilaudid or hydromorphone that would keep them from going through withdrawal, but to keep them from experiencing dope sickness and to help support them stay isolated instead of going out and interacting with multiple people to get their drugs. Uh, how can we support them to stay at home during this time uh, or stay in shelter or wherever it might be? That is an incredibly problematic way to roll out safe supply for so many reasons. Uh, and the first and foremost, as I've already said, is that people use drugs for way more reasons than just avoiding going through withdrawal. Uh, and because it wasn't a, an initiative that was created to acknowledge all of the different ways and, and, and needs that people have, uh, it was a failure from the onset. The other issue with tying it to COVID-19 uh, was that it gave the intervention uh, the air of impermanence. It made people feel like this was only going to be available, this was only going to be an option as long as COVID was around. And so it made prescribers very hesitant 
to prescribe because they were worried that they would prescribe people medications and then a few months would go by, COVID would be gone, and they would have to then find ways to de-prescribe people because they wouldn't be allowed to do it anymore. So there's a lot of harms generated from the way that this was rolled out. Uh, people who did roll it out will say they had to use COVID to open the door, that that was their opportunity in order to get safe supply out in BC. But what it actually is, is, is a half measure. It's incrementalism. And what that, what that really you know, spells is disaster for safe supply, because when we do things halfway and then they don't end up working, that's exactly what detractors of safe supply need to hear so that they can say, look, we tried this and it doesn't work. Uh, and that's that's we are in a risky time for safe supply right now because of that. This graph that I have up on the wall here or on the on the PowerPoint uh, is a guide that I made uh, at somewhere in, during the pandemic uh, to help people figure out how they can support one another and advocate to access a safe supply. And if you've read any of it, you'll see that it's really challenging, even in a province that has a quote unquote safe supply. Uh, it's incredibly difficult to access one. And what we found out when we were working in the parks and, and BC's risk mitigation guidance documents had come out uh, is that there's an incredible amount of paternalism that people are going to have to deal with with their prescribers. Uh, when the risk mitigation guidance documents came out, we actually believed that prescribers were going to have some kind of moral or ethical impetus to do this prescribing, that it was, that it was a no-brainer that people would have to do it. But what actually happened was people contacted their doctors and their doctors said, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, and it actually ended up being a bit of a traumatizing process where when people went to their doctors and asked for a safe supply, uh, it went to the opposite direction where it, it hindered that relationship because they had to admit that they were using illegal substances. And that actually jeopardized some people's trust and relationships with their doctors uh, which is really harmful if you've been on methadone for an extremely long time. Your doctor takes your carries away because he finds out you're taking street fentanyl uh, instead of actually prescribing you Dilaudid to help you uh, avoid the recourses of the toxic drug supply. I had one physician uh, uh, when I called him and tried to support someone who was at an incredible risk uh, in the encampments. Uh, I, this person was, was his doctor. And I said, could, could, would you consider prescribing a safe supply? And the physician said, uh, laughed at me and said, I'm a recovery doctor, not a Dilaudid doctor. So we spent three days, um, working to find this individual, a different doctor, firing that doctor, getting them an intake, uh, and then getting them started on a safe supply. But during those three days, uh, that person was at incredibly high risk and had very few options available to them. I'm just wondering, did you want to uh, maybe have some questions come your direction just to give you a chance to catch your breath and take a drink in that? What a great time because we're at this slide that says reflection. <laughs> we go. <laughs> Right, perfect. So uh, we did have a comment come in, and I and I think it was Linda that had um, shared it, um, just stating that Alberta needs to update their government site, considering the site that they were looking at still holds 2017 numbers. Um, I'm not sure as to which Linda it was on the on the email. We have a couple of uh, email uh, registrants that are named Linda. So what I'll do is I'll shoot an email with a link to an updated Alberta site. Um, there have been some changes in Alberta as far as where you can access information and having stuff that is um, up to date. So I can send that to you afterwards just so that we can have an information share to help you out. Um, so the next one that come up was, is hydromorphine a suitable replacement for someone using fentanyl? Uh, it depends on how much hydromorphone and it depends on uh, what that individual is actually asking for and what they're there. There are people who uh, are on our program and there are people who have access hydromorphone who are reporting benefits and who are feeling supported by it and are saying that this is enough for me. Uh, and that's great that that's one option that's available to people. But for the most part, uh, many people who are using fentanyl uh, on the street right now or, or using for the illegal supply, their tolerances are incredibly high. And so uh, it, it takes a very large amount of Dilaudid in order to actually meet those tolerances. Um, that being said, uh, it's, it, it's one option that needs to continue to be there, but it's just one option of many that need to be there. 
Uh, and right now, for the majority of people who are accessing a, a safe supply, uh, Dilaudid is the only option that's available to them. Our next uh, comment, I guess, a little bit of a question is maybe because you might have some insight on it, is there seems to be little mention of carfentanil on the news. Do you know of any information that may have some rhyme or reason to that? I mean, there seems to be different news cycles where carfentanil is, you know, every couple of months we see a, a bit of a news cycle of carfentanil being out there, be careful, and the drug supply is toxic. Um, what I the carfentanil is definitely still there. And if you read some of the drug checking reports, both from the BC CDC and from uh, substance here on Vancouver Island, uh, they routinely find you know five to eight samples that contain carfentanil. Um, and it really just speaks to the fact that like we're so far into this public health emergency that it's not that surprising anymore that carfentanil was there or that carfentanil has contaminated the market or even maybe established itself in the market. Can I get a bag, please? Um, yes, it's 604. Sorry about that. That's okay. Someone get Sasha a bag. Yeah. <laughs> All right, not sure if you finished or if we want to continue. I'm sorry, I got distracted there. Yeah, no, that's 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 perfectly fine. I think what I, the point that I'm trying to get across is that uh, you see these drug alerts that come out and every week there's a drug alert that's posted and it says, watch out, the drug supply is toxic. There's an overdose alert. Uh, and sometimes they list the colors. There's blue down that's causing overdoses. There's purple down that's causing overdoses. And what it means to people who are working in the sector and for people who are using drugs is, is yes, the, the drug supply is toxic uh, and that it is incredibly volatile and that it changes every single day. Uh, and so carfentanil is definitely there, but I'm not sure particularly why it doesn't make the media as often as it used to. I think it's like everything, it sort of has its flavors of the moment and continues on and, you know, definitely is that uh, might not be right the front and center, but it's still part of the picture. Um, we, the had next a, we had a drug alert in, in Vancouver Island that was just extended week after week. They're supposed to take the drug alerts down after one week and they just kept announcing that they're extending it for an additional week. And for, for all of us, we just felt like that, okay, so yeah, things are really awful right now. And the drug supply is worsened uh, and doesn't appear to be uh, in the process of improving anytime soon. So the next one that um, come up was um, meth tests are pure in our area. And if I recall, this person is from BC, but definitely needs major attention. Definitely needs to have a lot more understanding of, um, I guess, the the impact of meth and how it is a little bit different or what all it actually entails. Did you want to speak to that at all, Corey? Yeah, I mean, uh, there still needs to be options for people to have alternatives to methamphetamine. And from a safe supply perspective, uh, the Victoria Safer Initiative, we offer um, dexedrine and Ritalin as alternative options to uh, stimulants. Uh, however, not enough attention has been paid to stimulants and not enough uh, work has been done in order to find out what an actual suitable option for a stimulant safe supply would be. Um, what we've what we've found is that the dexedrine and the Ritalin have been beneficial for a small amount of people, uh, and those tend to be people who have untreated ADHD uh, and and are perhaps using their methamphetamine because it helps them focus and it helps uh, their ADHD symptoms. However, dexedrine and Ritalin is completely unsuitable for many people who are using uh, methamphetamine on the street. Uh, and we need to see options that are also smokable uh, in, in BC and abroad. There's no options for safe supply for people who smoke their drugs, uh, even though here in BC, the number one way that people die by overdose is when they smoke their drugs. Um, did you want to continue with some questions or did you want to continue with part of your, your presentation? Do one more question. Okay. So the next one is what safe supply is available for stimulants? Is Adderall XR being offered or desoxin? Oh, great. Well, it's just a continuation from the last question. Um, yeah. So dexedrine and Ritalin are options that are available. Desoxin is not available in Canada yet. Um, and nor does is it 
going to be like as great as as people think because it's still not injectable and it's so it's still a tablet option and uh, for many people it's about the route that they use their substances as well as uh, what's available to them uh, and Adderall is an option that's available through the program that I work at uh, it's it's a third option uh, that's available if the dexedrine and the Ritalin don't work. Okay, so carrying on, uh, talk a little bit about harm reduction just to frame the rest of the conversation. Uh, everything that we just talked about was meant to be a bit of an um, introduction or to get people thinking about this. And now we're going to get into the more formal part of the presentation. Uh, and the reason why I talk about harm reduction uh, at the start of this is because I want you to have the principles of harm reduction and what harm reduction really means uh, in your heads while you are uh, learning about safe supply. Uh, so people can perhaps mute their mic. Um, thank you. So what is harm reduction? Um, my favorite definition, there's public health approaches to harm reduction, obviously reducing the risk, understanding that people are going to use substances uh, or that they could potentially engage in higher risk activities and we want them to be safe. And that really is a very uh, black and white public health way of looking at harm reduction. Uh, in truth, harm reduction is really about uh, drug user liberation and it is about rectifying the harms of the war on, the dr of the war on drugs. It's about uh, the radical redistribution of power and resources to those who are not afforded that. Uh, and, and personally, if you ever have time to watch this short video, there's a video by First Nations Health Authority uh, called Taking Care of Each Other, Hopes for the Future. And the, uh, their, their definition of harm reduction is as follows. Mainstream harm reduction practices such as naloxone distribution, and opioid substitution therapies have been proven to save lives. However, they are narrowly focused on substance using behaviors and do not address the broader social and system-wide issues that contribute to and intersect with substance use for indigenous peoples in the first place. For indigenous communities, harm reduction means reducing the harms of colonization. This means that indigenous harm reduction is not tethered to the use of substances. Instead, indigenous harm reduction is a way of life embedded within traditional knowledge systems that see the spiritual world, the natural world, and human, humanity as interrelated. Given that these knowledge systems and the way that they give rise to have been disrupted by the historic and ongoing impacts of colonization, Indigenous harm reduction is about rectifying those harms. When we talk about the war on drugs, it's important that we also talk about the iron law of prohibition because the more we double down on law enforcement, the more we actually worsen the drug supply. And so the iron law of prohibition states that the harder the enforcement, the harder the drugs. When we increase law enforcement, we increase the cost of illegality and we increase the potency of substance. That's why we've seen uh, the evolution of opium to heroin to fentanyl and now carfentanyl. <coughs> the war on drugs is also racist, and it's important that we continue to understand that. Uh, colonization is deeply linked to the war on drugs here in Canada, uh, and for many instances it's been used to control and survey uh, Black, Indigenous, people of colour. Harm reduction can be traced back to the people organizing in the 1960s, and it's important that we understand that harm reduction is in itself grounded in the rights and the lives of people who use drugs. And first and foremost, it's intended to affirm the lives of people who use drugs. Uh, and so when we're talking about safe supply, we need to make sure that we're framing all of these principles uh, under the safe supply. So the principle of harm, principles of harm reduction include that drug use is a human behavior and that many people across the world are unwilling or unable to stop. The second principle is that people who use drugs do not lose their rights due to their drug use. The third is that people use drugs for many different reasons and in many different ways. The fourth is that harm reduction is evidence-based. The fifth is that harm reduction is committed to meeting people where they are at without judgment. And the sixth is that options for prevention, care, and treatment must be evidence-based, high quality, and non-coercive. 
And that's a really important principle right there to be considering when we're talking about a safe supply. Because what we've seen in BC thus far uh, and abroad is there's a lot of coercion embedded within safe supply right now. And for the most part, many people cannot access a safe supply unless they're willing to go on to other forms of treatment like methadone or cadian. Uh, people have had really bad experiences with methadone and cadian in the past, and some of them have experienced medicalized traumas related to those types of treatments. And forcing someone to go on to something that they don't want to go on to in order to access a medication that could save their lives is coercion and unethical. The seventh is that people who use drugs must be involved in designing, implementing, and evaluating programs and policies that serve them. Uh, that, again, is a really important consideration when we're talking about safe supply, because if these safe supply initiatives are not uh, developed, if they're not informed by people with lived and living experience of criminalized drug use, then they have very little chance of being successful. The eighth principle is that harm reduction is rooted in a commitment to social justice. And the ninth principle is that harm reduction challenges policies and practices that cause harm. So it's important that we think about this as we move forward and talk about safe supply. And so if you're someone who works in this sector, if you work in harm reduction, if you're a prescriber, if you're a provider, a researcher, an academic, uh, I want you to think just now and after reflecting on those principles, uh, how how do you implement harm reduction at the, where you work? How can harm reduction be further embedded within the way that you practice both on an organizational standpoint and as an individual in the way that you do your work? Now back to safe supply. Why do we want to see a safe supply? Why is it important that we have safe supply? Uh, well, first and foremost, we, we want people to stop dying. We want people to stop dying preventable deaths. We want uh, to stem the tide of this devastating public health emergency that is preventable and that could have been resolved much earlier if there was political will and action. We also want a safe supply because we want less people incarcerated. We want less people interacting with police. We want to reduce the criminalization of people and through the provision of a legal and regulated safe supply of drugs, we would reduce the likelihood that people will be unjustly criminalized for their substance use. We also want to do a safe supply because when people are able to access a safe supply, they experience improved stability as defined by them. And when we eliminate the need to hustle or finance illegal substance use on a daily basis, people can focus on other matters that are vital to their health. It also reduces the likelihood of people acquiring COVID because that means they don't have to interact with as many people. It's cost effective because we decrease overdose, police intervention, incarceration, and disease transmission, which means we actually save money. People who are able to access the safe supply are also able to reconnect to the healthcare system and to the social service system in a way that fosters trust and relationships, which means they are able to get uh, a chance to see their doctor. They're able to get their blood work completed. They're able to get their birth certificate or their ID completed uh, because many people have experienced so many harms at the hands of healthcare workers and at the hands of social workers and physicians that they haven't been able to get some of the things that they need to get done uh, because they are, there's no trust there already. We also want a safe supply because it means that there will be less stigma because criminality is one of the things that continues to foster <laughs> stigma. We want less people to experience withdrawal uh, because when you have an access to a legal regulated supply of substances and there's less likelihood that you'll go through cravings and withdrawal. And we also want to do safe supply because it's a gateway towards decriminalization. Decriminalization of people who use substances is the next step. Uh, to turning the tide in the overdose crisis. It's one of many steps that need to be taken. And Safe Supply acknowledges that substance use is not something that should be punished or moralized. Now, when we talk about Safe Supply, uh, we need to understand that the Government of Canada, Health Canada, has different definitions for what Safe Supply should look like. And so they define safe supply in three different ways. It can either be a traditional safe supply, an enhanced safe supply, or a flexible safe supply. 
And these are all models that exist within the current legislative framework. These are all models that can be implemented before decriminalization occurs uh, and they can be implemented right now. Now, this is also problematic and the federal government shouldn't be defining uh, safe supply models uh, because again, it should be defined by people who use drugs. Uh, and when you look at what they think a traditional model for safe supply is, they include opioid agonist therapy, methadone and suboxone. And if you talk to many people who use drugs, they'll be quick to say that OAT is not safe supply. They also have enhanced models listed as things like IOT programs and tablet IOT programs. Those are models like the Crosstown Clinic or the Molson Overdose Prevention Site, uh, where people can go uh, to overdose prevention sites and receive tablet uh, hydromorphone or injectable hydromorphone and use under supervision of a healthcare provider. And then they have flexible models for safe supply. And a flexible model, uh, by the definition of Health Canada, includes uh, being low threshold and harm reduction in public health informed, embedded within primary care, supervised consumption services, overdose prevention sites, con uh, consumption and treatment centers, uh, or housing pathways. This is the uh, category where the program that I work in is, is currently working in. Uh, and there are a couple of other programs that technically meet the criteria to be a flexible model. But again, even when you look and learn a little bit about the Safer Victoria Initiative and some of these other flexible models, they still truly aren't as flexible as they need to be in order to be accessible to people who are at risk of overdose. And why isn't safe supply accessible to people? Well, we talked about BC's risk mitigation guidance document, but there's a bigger elephant in the room. And that elephant is called addiction medicine. And this is where I'm gonna say things that are gonna challenge people uh, because addiction medicine is not the same as harm reduction. And most safe supply initiatives across the country right now are framed under the guise of addiction medicine and withdrawal management. They're framed to get people onto treatment. They're framed to get people onto OAT. Uh, and they're highly paternalistic and high barrier. They involve obsessions with urine drug screens. Uh, they are involved daily dispensing and not providing people with carries or take home doses. Uh, and all of those barriers that exist uh, hinder an, abil an individual's ability to access a safe supply. But if we were to frame safe supply under the guise of harm reduction, we would see participants and individuals as members of their own care team and that they would have their needs identified by themselves and the team would work to uphold them. What you see in addiction medicine programming is, is oftentimes the priorities or the goals of the practitioner, uh, of, the, of the prescriber. And it's not about what the participant views as a metric for success, but what uh, the, the care team views as a metric for success. If we were to do things through a harm reduction modality, prescriptions wouldn't be provided as a means to withdrawal manage, oh, to manage withdrawal, but also just to provide a safer alternative to what people are taking. What we see right now is that medications are provided and they're not meeting people's needs. They're not smokable options. They're not high enough doses. Uh, and so what we're seeing is an ineffective safe supply. If it was framed under a harm reduction modality, you'd see people with lived and living experience leading the charge and being the ones uh, who are given the opportunities to help innovate this instead of it being gatekept by physicians and nurses. What we see, unfortunately, though, is urine drug screens, missed doses, and flawed metrics to use success. Uh, in, in many instances, when I've talked to people about safe supply, people who aren't in favor of a safe supply, I'll tell them, you know, they're benefiting from this. They're telling us that they're benefiting from this. Uh, and, and the prescriber or the individual who I'm talking to uh, doesn't actually believe that that person is benefiting. They don't believe that they're telling the truth. And that's really problematic because it speaks to the mistrust that exists uh, in those types of programs. So why isn't it working right now? Well, it's the wrong type of drugs. Uh, we know that hydromorphone is one option for people, uh, but we need a whole range of options, uh, options for people who use stimulants, options for people who use opioids, uh, and we need to see an improvement in the menu of options that are available to people. 
Uh, we also need to see an improvement in the doses that are available for people. And moving forward, if we don't have people who use drugs actually guiding the development of these programs, we're going to continue to see many issues with them. As I've said before, it's being delivered through an addiction medicine model, which is problematic because it leads to prescriber gatekeeping related to things like risk aversion. Doctors are, are personally, there's a lot of fear that they might be liable if they prescribe to someone. Um, there's a lot of ideology that still exists. And even the way that we, we talk about safe supply in BC is flawed right from the onset. Uh, in, in Vancouver Island, it's called PPRM, not safe supply, which is pandemic prescribing risk mitigation. So they embedded the pandemic right into the title of the safe supply because it's being framed as a tool to reduce COVID transmission, not reduce overdose risk. Uh, outside of uh, Vancouver Island, it's called RMG prescribing or risk mitigation guidance prescribing. And that too is linking to COVID-19. There's no considerations for people who are smoking their drugs currently. Uh, and while we're exploring options, it still seems like it's a long ways away. There continues to be lots and lots of barriers for people. Some people are only given one week prescriptions with the requirements to provide urine drug screens. Uh, nobody really receives carries or take home doses right now. Uh, and then there's frequent cutoffs that happen to people if they miss a couple of doses. Uh, if they don't make it to the pharmacy every single day, then all of a sudden their prescription is cut off. What people really aren't talking about right now is that there is a disparate amount of rural and remote inequities right now. If you don't live in Vancouver or Victoria, your likelihood of accessing any form of safe supply uh, plummets. Uh, and that is really unfortunate because people use drugs in every community and people deserve access uh, to a safe and regulated supply in any community. And as I've said before, uh, the coercive uh, nature of some of these programs requiring people to go on to treatment has been a significant barrier to access. Now, why does this continue to happen? It's because people are caught in the cycle of inaction. Uh, there is a lot of discomfort in continuing to assume risk to prescribe a safe supplier, to prescribe pharmaceutical alternatives to the toxic drug supply. And so what we find is people in the middle who are saying things like we need decriminalization, we need a demedicalized model for safe supply, which yes, we do, but we also need the prescribers and the people who have power to do something now to act. Uh, and if we don't have that, we won't get to the more accessible demedicalized models. So I, I rewrote the safe supply continuum because I didn't like the one that the federal government made. Uh, and what we see here in this model is that there are different types of safe supply and we need all of them available along the continuum in order for people to have options in order for no matter where you are in your life and in your own journey that you can walk into some place and get access to a safe supply. And that can be through a clinical delivery model like injectable opioid agonist therapy like the Crosstown Clinic, but it can also be through a harm reduction model like the SAFER initiative that I'm gonna to talk to you about in a little bit, uh, like having safe supply embedded within overdose prevention sites and supervised consumption services, like the MySafe opioid vending machine. And really we need to continue to push towards a harm reduction approach to safe supply because we gotta get further over to the right where we'll see decriminalization, heroin compassion clubs, legalization and regulation. People can go into a dispensary just like how now at the end of this presentation, I can go to the liquor store and I can purchase something and I can know for sure what concentration of alcohol it contains and that it doesn't also contain benzodiazepines and concentrations of fentanyl. So now I think I'll take a pause and answer some questions uh, and well, before we get into the Victoria Safer Initiative. Awesome, thanks Corey. All right, so I think there's actually been a few comments that uh, you've actually touched upon um, just in the total agreement that there's still a lot more work to be done, um, how some things are definitely um, <clears throat> not working. Um, it's not a, a one size fits all kind of solution. It's very unique depending on the person and the situation. Um, one question did come up and I'm not exactly 100% sure, but their, their comment is, is there, is there a safe supply and do you need increasing doses to maintain? 
I'm assuming that that would be in regards to the opioid replacement therapy that they'd be um, referring to as far as increasing, increasing your doses to maintain. Could you speak to that? I think, uh, well, I mean, so the safe supply exists in, in one iteration right now. It exists through the medicalized model. It exists in the uncomfortable intersections of harm reduction and addiction medicine, and it is benefiting some, uh, and we absolutely need higher doses available to people. But I, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe that question meant to say, like when people are on a safe supply, does their dose need to continue going up? Uh, and, and the answer is that it has to all be tailored to an individual context. So, and so everybody has different tolerances. Everybody has different comfort levels. They have different com compounding factors, including chronic pain, uh, and other reasons why they might need higher doses. And so, um, there isn't a, a panacea for safe supply, especially from a prescriber driven model where one dose is going to work for every single person. It has to be tailored on a case by case basis. Perfect. Um, so then there is a bit of a comment and then a, what are your thoughts on this? So this person had commented that they've seen some clients with hydromorphine prescriptions that are still witness doses, just like the opioid replacement therapies like methadone and suboxone. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, that's really problematic because are they taking that one do uh, do they have to go back to the pharmacy multiple times a day to have their doses witnessed? What happens in these types of programs where people are required to attend multiple times in a day in order to get what they need to stay safe and to stay alive is that they become tethered to those programs uh, and their lives start to revolve around those programs. And though their needs might've been met through a safe supply, they're completely controlled by the program and they have, don't have the opportunity to go and do something else. And if we give people what they need and also give them a chance to make their own decisions, uh, then they can continue to do things like get access to uh, their identification or they can go and have fun or do something fulfilling or connect with friends and people who are tethered to these programs don't get those opportunities. So the next person had uh, made a comment and gave a bit of background as far as the uh, challenge that their family has been presented with. Um, but their question is, is as a parent trying to keep their child alive while waiting, while waiting to be able to access some services, it seems to be the most loving thing that they can do. Providing a low dose of hydromorph, is that harm reduction or enabling? And why does the system still look at this as continuing the addiction instead of treating the disease? Yeah, I think we have to go back to the principles of harm reduction and that people use drugs and, and are going to continue using drugs. And if you don't provide a uh, safe and regulated supply of drugs, that doesn't mean people aren't going to use. It means that they're going to have to take their chances with an unknown market with a volatile <coughs> drug supply that's killing people. Uh, and so, you know, if it means that absolutely it's harm reduction it's not enabling we don't we're not you're not encouraging someone to use drugs you're just accepting them for who they are and not judging them uh, and then also validating and affirming that their lives have have meaning and that they deserve to be alive uh, and uh, absolutely you're always going to see detractors of safe supply or any form of harm reduction say you know, giving someone access to a sterile needle is enabling them to inject drugs and that's so flawed uh, of an argument uh, because the truth is that we know that providing someone with safer options isn't encouraging them to be less safe. Uh, and so, yeah, no, I, I, I think that it's a really frustrating uh, statement to hear and we're going to continue to see that rhetoric uh, because substance use is highly moralized, unfortunately, um, but we need to keep pushing back against that narrative. So we have a comment that in Alberta, we hear arguments from politicians comparing safer supply to overprescribing. What would your reply to be? What would your reply be to such a flawed argument? Oh well, I mean, we know for a fact now that overprescribing wasn't the reason why the overdose crisis took hold of folks, and that it's an urban legend that. Uh, doctors overprescribing is the reason why we're in the middle of this toxic drug supply. 
Um, and so it's, it's a bit of just the, it's a re rhetoric based argument that you're going to hear from Alberta, as long as you continue to elect the United Conservative Party into power, um, because that's, that's their go to is to, is to make people stir up emotions and to use flawed arguments in order to drive what they need to do. Uh, with that being said, um, I would explain to people that um, right now, the number of people who are dying by prescription opioids is, is minuscule. People aren't dying by prescribed opioids. They're dying by toxic fentanyl that's on the street. Uh, here in BC, uh, the BC CDC did a, a report on risk related to people who were prescribed safe supply. And what they found was that over the course of three months, uh, of the some 2,800 people who were accessing a safe supply, less than 0.4% of them had died by overdose. And even those individuals who died by overdose still had toxic fentanyl in their system. And so what that told us is that prescribed safe supply wasn't killing people. And in fact, what continues to kill people is the toxic drug supply. So you had mentioned the comparison um, between drugs and with buying alcohol. Do you think that it, that is the ultimate model that anyone over the age of 18 can just walk into a store and buy any drugs that they would like? No, I think that we need to move away from sayings like the ultimate model um, because it, every, we need a whole compendium of models available to people. The most effective model is the one that's not scalable. That's uniquely built around your community and the needs of the people who are in your community. Uh, I do believe that we should see dispensaries. I do believe that we should see uh, regulated supplies available for people to come in and, and choose what they're going to use and to not have to provide a piss test in order to get it uh, and to not have to see a doctor or be assessed by a nurse in order to access it. And it's the deregulation, the prohibition that is driving risk. And so when you regulate substances, it actually makes them safer. Uh, and what we found even just recently, I was reading a news article about cannabis uh, and there was a cannabis recall because a, a big supply was moldy and Health Canada pulled it off the shelves before anybody got sick from it. And these are the things that can happen for other drugs. Uh, and the reason why other drugs are more dangerous isn't because of the drugs, it's because of the laws that make them more dangerous. And uh, I believe that we need to stop uh, platforming one substance over the other and people need to be able to have the agency of choice uh, in what they're taking. Thank you. Okay, we do have a couple more. Um, do you wanna keep going with questions? Sure. Okay. So we have uh, safe supply is so important, but to get people clean and using the situation of only fentanyl is available is something that should be looked at. So I guess that one was a little bit more of a comment, but also maybe a, a bit of a discussion point from your perspective with uh, your diversity of perspective on it. Can you can you repeat the, that question? For sure. So it's a little bit more of a comment, but in case you wanted to comment back to it. Safe supply is so important, but to get people clean and using the situation of only fentanyl is available is something that should be looked at. I'm not sure I, I understand the statement fully. Um, however, I, what I will say you know, about both the people getting clean comment is that it's it's okay if people are going to continue to use drugs. like. The goal of safe supply isn't isn't to force people to stop using drugs uh, and quite often we'll hear from people who aren't in favor of safe supply and they'll say something like but how do you help them get off drugs some people don't want to stop using drugs uh, and that's okay and we need to actually be able to say that comfortably um, because it's it's okay yeah everyone uses drugs for some reason and some people use drugs that are illegal and some use drugs that are legal uh and it's okay the thing that's not okay is that the prohibition and making them illegal makes them riskier okay and the last one that i have at this moment because i've got a couple that had said that their questions were uh were answered um so safe supply comes with some diversion which used as an argument against safe supply by opponents what are your thoughts on diversion? Uh, well, actually, I'm going to be talking about that shortly because it's uh, we, we can't make it through a conversation of safe supply without people talking about diversion. And uh, 
to be honest, diversion, fears of diversion are related to individual risk aversion. Um, it's about people prescribing, not wanting to potentially have their license at risk because someone sold their drugs. It has nothing to do with uh, less safety for people who are receiving those diverted drugs, because the truth is that more safe, available, more readily available, safe and regulated drugs on the street is always better than more toxic fentanyl on the street. Uh, and we want, when people are diverting their drugs, it means that we're not providing them with drugs that are actually meeting their needs. Uh, it means that we need to be able to have better options available to them. Uh, and also when we talk about diversion, uh, people aren't just type, they, they keep getting typecasted into like trying to set up a business or capitalize or manipulate their safe supply prescription. But a lot of times when people sell their drugs, it's situational something happens to them and they have all of their property destroyed by by bylaw or they get evicted or uh, something happens and so it's a one-time thing that happens that still doesn't mean that they're not benefiting from their medications it doesn't mean that they're not benefiting from their safe supply it means that life is really complicated and sometimes people need to do things out of desperation to survive uh, and we shouldn't be punishing them and making their lives even harder after that Awesome, thanks, Corey. So that's all the questions that I that have been uh, put forward at this point in time. So I'm going to let you continue on with your uh, with your presentation, considering I'm sure you have a few more that uh, a few more areas to cover that we're just thinking about. Absolutely. So uh, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about the project that uh, I work in here in Victoria, uh, and that is the Victoria Safer Initiative. The Victoria Safer Initiative is a federally funded uh, program from the substance use and addiction program with the federal government and we were tasked in june of 2020 with developing implementing and evaluating a flexible and harm reduction model for safe supply uh, and we were given nine to ten months to do that uh, during a pandemic and an ongoing overdose emergency and so it wasn't very much time to figure out how we were going to do that and how we were going to do it in a way uh, that was going to be effective and different than BC's risk mitigation guidance documents. So in order to do that, uh, we started a two-pronged approach uh, where we began service delivery right away. Uh, myself and a systems navigator and a, an outreach worker uh, went into uh, 12, the 12 different homeless encampments in Victoria, and we started connecting with people and doing intakes uh, and trying to connect them to a doctor just under the existing BC risk mitigation guidance. So just under uh, the specter of, of hydromorphone was the only option that was available for people. And while we did that, we started a concurrent service user design process where we did a, a community engagement process. We asked uh, people who use drugs, we asked uh, researchers and academics, uh, we asked physicians and nurses what they wanted us to consider when developing a model for safe supply. Uh, and then we also completed a concept mapping exercise. Uh, and that concept mapping exercise uh, was in partnership with Solid uh, Outreach, which is a local peer organization, and the Canadian Institute for Substance Use Research. And we created, we did seven different focus groups uh, where we asked people who inject their drugs, people who smoke their drugs, people who use stimulants, people uh, who sleep in encampments, people who sleep in hotels, uh, first people who identify as First Nations, Indigenous, Métis. Uh, we asked them all one centering question, which was, uh, safe supply would work for me if and we got them to fill in the blanks. And from the many responses that they gave us, uh, we were able to then uh, whittle those down into six main clusters of feedback that was given to us. And so people told us that they wanted the right dose and the right drugs for them. And what that meant was that we want they wanted doses that actually matched their tolerances. They wanted formulations that they could smoke. Uh, they wanted to be able to use it in the same way that they use their drugs currently. Uh, and so what we did right away was we rewrote the risk mitigation guidance documents. We rewrote BCCS used risk mitigation guidance documents, uh, and we intentionally divorced ourselves from COVID right away. And we made it a, a program that was about reducing the harms of the overdose crisis, not reducing the harms of COVID. 
Uh, and we also added oxycodone as an option for people to access. Uh, and the reason why we did that was uh, it's very strategic in that people uh, prior to uh, fentanyl hitting the streets, people were used to being able to smoke their oxys. Uh, and so we did actually find a somewhat smokable option available for folks. Uh, and the other reasons why we did that is because the 20 milligrams of oxys were almost the same morphine equivalent as the Dilaudid eight milligrams that were in the original document. And so it was easy to do drug conversions and to switch people over if we needed to. And the last reason we did that is because it was covered. Uh, so people wouldn't have to pay out of pocket in order to access their oxycodons, just like they didn't have to pay out of pocket to access hydromorphone. I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the other drugs that we've introduced over time. Uh, but people also asked us for a safe, positive and welcoming space they wanted to be able to go and access their safe supply, but to also be able to access other services and to be able to connect to services uh, based out of a fixed location. They wanted to be treated with respect and an ongoing theme here uh, with safe supply in BC and abroad is that people who use drugs and people who are trying to access a safe supply are not being treated with very much respect. People wanted to be able to access their safe supply easily. Uh, and what that meant was to not have to jump through a bunch of medicalized hoops, to not have to uh, see a, a physician every single day, to, to be able to have carries. Uh, and then people also wanted, and this is one of the most important things for me in and this program, is that they wanted a safe supply that helps them function and improve their quality of life as defined by them. So people want to be able to set their own goals. Why do I need a safe supply and want us to honor that? They don't want to be told that the reason why they're on safe supply is to eventually get off drugs or that to get them onto methadone or something like that. They don't want to be coerced. They want to be able to uh, experience agency of choice and for them to lead the charge in their own care. So we developed this model and it was an iterative approach. We've been very flexible and organic in the sense that we've tried to respond to issues and crises as they arise. Uh, originally, we were only able to offer safe supply programming through outreach. Uh, we didn't have a fixed location. Uh, and so we were out in the 12 different homeless encampments connecting with people on a regular basis. And we developed this model for safe supply uh, and at the center of this model is our participants who take the lead on identifying their needs related to substance use. And why do we do that? Because uh, we wanna make sure people have increased access to a safe supply and that if we're not being informed by our participants and if we're not being informed and told what people need by our participants, then we're going to very quickly become inaccessible to them because it won't be what they actually need and it won't, it won't be effective. We also have outreach workers with lived and living experience of criminalized drug use, uh, and they also are incredibly vital to our program because they're the bridge and trust uh, to, the, our, to our clinical team. They're the reason why participants originally uh, come to us, why they continue to come to us, uh, and the knowledge that our outreach workers with lived and living experience bring have been incredibly important in developing this program. We have nurses. Uh, who worked a full scope uh, and who really take the lead on doing the assessments. And we have six great physicians who work with us and they really operate from an anti-oppressive practice. They sit and have all of these uncomfortable conversations with us where we talk about uh, the, the issues related to medicalized models and they sit with that discomfort and work every day in order to try and make the program more accessible. We also have systems navigators, which are these really cool humans who help psychosocial support with our clients and our participants. Uh, and 90, over 90% 90 of our participants are currently engaged with systems navigators on things like ID or birth certificate, income assistance, housing applications. Uh, it became very clear early on that it wasn't just about providing people a safe supply, but about managing the many barriers that can hinder someone's ability to access a safe supply. Now, people talked about diversion, so I'm glad they did because we can bring this up now. Um, the province of BC actually commissioned an ethics analysis uh, where they asked really important questions related to things like diversion, uh, related to ethical obligations to prescribe. 
Uh, and so this ethics analysis actually showed that even if people are diverting their drugs because there's no witness in the administration, it would actually reduce the overall reliance of other people who use drugs on the toxic drug supply. And so that's a form of community harm reduction that they're talking about where they say, like, if somebody's going to go and use drugs, even if it's the first time that they're going to go and use drugs, uh, they would be much better off and much safer if they had access to Dilaudid than if their first use was going to be high concentrations of fentanyl mixed with benzodiazepines. This ethics analysis also showed that a healthcare professional would have, a, have an ethical obligation to prescribe a medication that would allow the drug user to avoid having recourse to a toxic drug supply rather than the professional insisting on only prescribing on the condition of engaging in individualized medical treatment that extends beyond what the individual requests. What that means is that we should prescribe the safe supply just because people need access to a safe supply, not because we want them to go into treatment, not because we want them to get onto some other form of medications. Uh, it needs to be as anti-coercive as possible. And also what this ethics analysis showed is that if data demonstrates that prescribing reduces the risk of harm, failure to prescribe could violate a healthcare professional's ethical obligation to the patient. So not only should we be doing this, but doctors who are disparaging safe supply, doctors who are trying to reduce access to safe supply are actually causing harm. Uh, and I wanna make that really clear because there was an op-ed that was recently put out by some doctors discouraging the prescribing of safe supply. And the title of the article was that they believed prescribing safe supply was doing harm. And it's actually the opposite. Those types of articles are the ones that do harm. So we, uh, we're able to get funded for an additional two years. And when we did that, we were able to open a clinic at Victoria Safer. And once we opened the clinic, we were able to start providing some of those medication options that were higher potency that matched the ways people use drugs. Uh, and so now we have three different programs in addition to our outreach program, which is still there. We have a fentanyl patch program. And the fentanyl patch program is an alternative to traditional OAT. Uh, so people don't have to go on to methadone or cadine or suboxone, but if they want something long acting, they can get a fentanyl patch. What's really great about that is that the patches last 48 to 72 hours. And so people don't have to come in every single day to get it. And we have participants telling us for the first time ever, they did something over the weekend, they left town, they did something that didn't require having to come back the next day. Because when you're on methadone or cadine or suboxone, you have to come every single day to the pharmacy. Uh, and so they're experiencing some more freedom. Uh, they actually also go up to higher doses that will match people's tolerances. We have an injectable sufentanil program, uh, which is like a lower barrier IOT program. People can receive up to four doses a day. Uh, it goes all the way up to 200 micrograms of sufentanil, uh, which is seven to 10 times stronger than fentanyl. And it's also low barrier in the sense that you can come in every single day and get four doses, or you can miss 29 days worth of doses and come in, come in on day 30 and still get a dose without having to see a doctor or jump through a bunch of hoops. And then we have this new program called a Fentora program, which is a dissolvable fentanyl pill. And it's like a fizzy candy. It goes under your tongue or in your cheek. Uh, and that's a twice a day medication that goes up to really high doses and actually uh, is meeting people's tolerances, uh, just the small amount of people that we have right now. And we just turned one in July uh, of 2021. Uh, and so we're really happy to see that we've been able to make some progress. Uh, our clinic is doing really well, and we're going to continue to push to explore other options, including diacetyl morphine, uh, smokable options, uh, because that's what our participants are telling us they need. And uh, this program will only succeed if we, if we listen to people who are trying to access it and we hear what they say when they tell us it's not working or that it could be improved. So Corey, just before you continue on, we do have a question in regards to this as to how many people are on the waiting list to be in a, to be a participant and what is the wait time? Yeah, I mean, that's a really challenging question because part of the problem with these types of programs is that they are lower capacity uh, or they, they 
they don't have as much room for people to come on. Uh, we have folks who are on a wait list right now, and it's a confluence of how much room do we have in the clinic, how much physician time do we have, uh, and all of these things make programs uh, less accessible. Uh, and so we, at present, uh, have an equity list where we are working specifically to bring people on uh, who are disproportionately impacted by by the toxic drug supply, which includes Black, Indigenous, people of color, uh, women, and gender diverse people. Uh, that's our primary focus. But other than that, our program is at capacity, uh, and that that is really challenging for some folks because when they hear about these great initiatives, they they want to be able to access them, or they have someone that they care about that they want to access, and it's really hard to say no to people. Uh, and we hate to say no to people uh, at the Victoria Safer Initiative, but it does happen. Another question on this topic is who is funding your program? Oh, yeah, I think I said that, but the federal government, the Substance Use and Addiction Program. Perfect. So I'm just looking at the time and just to be uh, you know, respectful for everyone's time. I know we were aiming for about that 90 minutes and we're getting close to that. So I just figured I'd check and see how much more presentation or how much more great information. We have very positive feedback coming on the information that you uh, have been sharing with us. And we do have a couple of questions as well for you, too. Yeah, I think I'm I think I'm clipping along at a good pace. We're almost almost through this. Uh, the last part I'm just going to more briefly go through, but this is uh, what we call the safer top 10. Uh, this doesn't get included in all of the presentations that we do, but this is the top 10 lessons that our team has learned. We actually polled our staff and asked them what they've learned about trying to offer a safe supply uh, amidst uh, the ongoing uh, dual healthcare pandemic, the dual crisis. Uh, and so the top 10 is, Number one is that the drugs must match the needs. Drug tolerances are outpacing the effectiveness of current pharmaceutical alternatives without options that include powdered fentanyl, diacetyl morphine, and other formulations that can match potency and preferred route. The illegal supply will continue to prevail. The second is that measures for success need to include self-reported benefits. Uh, this isn't something that gets very much clout when it comes to uh, doing evaluations. Unfortunately, people who are accessing these programs don't get listened to when they say that this is actually helping me unless it's measurable through a urine drug screen or some other more objective measurement. And we need to understand that there are, people are benefiting from the provision of pharmaceutical alternatives as it stands right now. The third is that people who use drugs are the experts of their own experiences and relationships with substances and decision making without proper collaboration with people who use drugs is unfortunately still the norm. And this results in highly clinical programs that don't actually match needs. The fourth is that service delivery models that are flexible and lead with people with lived and living experience are integral in fostering trust and connections to care. The fifth is that the provision of pharmaceutical alternatives through an addiction medicine model is limiting the impacts and reach of overdose prevention and harm reduction. The sixth is that people who use drugs take care of each other when drugs are shared, sold, or exchanged, aka diversion, it is often about providing care and meeting basic needs. The seventh is that safer supply is just one part of more equitable access to health and well-being. The eighth is that participants engage in better engage better in safe supply programs when working with staff who have lived and living experience of criminalized drug use. The ninth is that contempt, discrimination, stigma, and paternalism towards people who use drugs is a public health and human rights emergency. And number 10 is that safer supply is not the answer to the toxic drug supply crisis. In truth, we need all of the options available. We need people pushing for decriminalization. We need demedicalized models for safe supply, regulation, legalization. All of these need to be explored and supported if we want to see ourselves get out of this devastating crisis. So that's the end of the presentation. This is some artwork by a nurse that I work with, uh, who actually works in the in the project that I work with. Uh, her name is Anna Trowbridge, and she gave me permission to share some of this, uh, some of her art. Uh, and I'm happy to answer questions now. Thank you. So we do have a uh, sort of two questions that were pretty much the same in regards to recreational use and youth. Um, you know, they're looking at that more like that 18, 19 year old kind of um, age range probably even a little bit younger. Um, but they're just wondering as to, should someone of that 
um, that demographic who is looking to just try drugs, should they be able out, should they be allowed to access safe supply? I mean, if you, if they don't have access to the safe supply, are they not going to use the drugs? And if they don't have access to a safe, safe supply, what drugs are they going to use? I think everybody, uh, knows that there is more discomfort when we talk about youth and we talk about some of these other um, intersecting factors. Uh, but the truth is that youth are dying also by toxic fentanyl. Uh, youth are buying what they think is Xanax tablets and ending up dying on fentanyl. Uh, and if we can't include youth in the conversations about harm reduction and safe supply, uh, we're going to keep burying our children and that needs to stop. And so, yes, safe supply is something that's needed for younger populations as well, even if it makes you really uncomfortable to say it. Okay. So with that being said, then how do, how do you make sure that they have, that the dose that they're receiving is safe if you don't want them tethered to having to access a dispensary? I think that it, we need to, uh, trust what people are using on the streets. I think that um, there's a there's a disbelief that people's tolerances are as high as they are. Uh, and what people are taking on the street right now is so incredibly potent uh, that all of the options that we have available, even the fentanyl based options uh, that I spoke about at the Victoria Safer Initiative are considerably underdosing compared to what people are taking on the street. Uh, and so obviously education regulation doesn't just mean everyone can come in and use regulation means that there are different concentrations that there is education that comes with what you're using that there are age restrictions all of these things are embedded within current regulated models like cannabis dispensaries uh, and liquor stores and so that same logic needs to be applied as well to other substances. Awesome. So we have, I actually have two more questions. Um, so for someone who smokes two grams of fentanyl a day, plus uses a bit of meth, do you think there will be a safe supply that will be able to address this high level of use in the near future? If someone's using two grams of fentanyl a day, mm -hmm. do I think that there will be a safe supply option that is available to them. Yeah. I mean, I think that it takes a while to titrate people up uh, and we have people on our program who use comparable amounts. And so they end up on uh, 1500 micrograms worth of fentanyl patches, which is 15, 100 microgram patches. And it's a lot, uh, but then they're actually having their needs met and they're not going through withdrawal and they're not sick in the morning and they don't have the urge to use. And even though not using the street supply wasn't their original goal, uh, they're telling us that they don't feel like they wanna use. And so I, it absolutely is possible. Um, we just need to see better options available. Okay. Okay. And our last question is, do you believe that the opioid replacement therapy does in fact work for some people? And do you ever hear people that are, that are able to get longer carries? Yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a number of people who benefit from opioid agonist therapy. And uh, again, it's not a one size fits all. I, I hate the, the statement about like silver bullet or, or whatever, but it's, it depends on what the goals of the individual are. And if they want to access cadine or methadone or suboxone, it needs to be made available to them so that they can um, get what they need and, and people do benefit from it. Uh, there's many people who, who benefit from their, from their opioid agonist therapy. And then there are many people who don't and they need other options. Uh, and then there are people who won't benefit from those other options and we need to have all, all potential options invested in and explored and made as low barrier and accessible as possible to people. A lack of caries is one of the biggest issues and it happens also with opioid agonist therapy. And what it boils down to is a lot of really stigmatizing criteria that get used to determine if someone can have caries. And it includes things like, are they housed? How often, how many urine drug screens have they provided? Uh, and, but, but there are people who, there is actually a criteria that exists in BC for providing carries through the addiction medicine lens. It's just very few people actually get it uh, because the criteria is way too rigid and way too high barrier. 
We actually have one, one, one other question that come in, um, which sort of, um, I guess, you know, alludes to that or carries that conversation going forward. How do we challenge the medical model? We know that it's a huge challenge, but how do we turn around and challenge it back to make things better? Yeah, I mean, it depends on where, where you are. I mean, if you're, if you're a prescriber, the best way to challenge the medical model is to prescribe um, and to make those drugs more available to people and to help create more solidarity with other prescribers who are prescribing a safe supply. Uh, if you're an advocate and you're so, or a concerned community member, uh, support action like the uh, GoFundMe from Dolph, uh, support non-medicalized models for safe supply and uh, write to your MLA, your MP, your city councillor, ask for a demedicalized model for a safe supply. Uh, you can challenge it by, you know, simply learning more about what some of the harms are and having those difficult conversations with your family members. Uh, there's many different ways that we can challenge these models from right from individual conversations to system system level change. Perfect. All right. So that's all of our questions uh, for tonight. Um, I would just like to say a big thank you. Um, I will share, um, we have many, many positive comments and thank yous in that in our comment section as well. So I'll be forwarding some uh, additional follow-up information with you, Corey, um, you know, cause I think it's important that we, uh, that we have that positive coming at us because we know it's a heavy, very heavy topic and we can definitely feel the weight of it some days more than others. So it's good to have those little shots of sunshine coming at us too. So we wanna make sure that we share that with you. And then that way you can uh, just know that you are truly appreciated um, not only within our circles, but with many, I'm sure with within many, within many more, but at the same time, we want to make sure that you know that we appreciate you and all the work that you do and for taking the time to share your knowledge with us. Um, as a token of our appreciation, we are going to, you'll have to check your email. Um, if you haven't seen it already, um, I will be following up with you on that. Um, just a small token, again, just to say thank you for everything that you do. Um, just before we do go, though, we do have a door prize that we were going to uh, be you know saying a thank you to everyone for attending this has been an amazing we had over 250 registered tonight and we were 90 some that were able to attend and many many more messages coming in um, asking about if we were going to be able to uh, share the slides or be able to record it and such so like I said at the beginning this will be recorded and by next week we'll have it posted on the mom stop the harm YouTube channel so please watch for it there you can see the whole slide deck, the whole presentation and have everything for reference at that point. So we had just randomly chose a number earlier. Um, it was number 89 as far as registration and attendance. And um, ironically, I think this person is pretty awesome that wins um, Mom's Stop the Harm t-shirt. And that is actually Elizabeth Dent. And Elizabeth, I'm just wondering if you can maybe turn your camera on and give us a wave. Um, Elizabeth is our funder with Health Canada, or she's a representative. So she is the lady that we work with to keep our, you know, to, in regards to reporting, to receive that money, to have the Stronger Together Canada program happening. So definitely a great appreciation. And definitely, again, just another, a small token of thank you. But now we, now she can show off, uh, you know, wear it a little more often than probably her other clothes, just to show that she's a partner in crime with us. So when I say a partner in crime is very, uh, you know, very funny, not anything negative. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again for everyone. Uh, just double check if Petra, did you have any last final comments or anything you would like to, to share? Just a, just a huge thank you again to Corey. This was always, always informative, enlightening, encouraging, challenging, and we take all this away and take it into our region and make sure that we move safer supply from the left coast and, and across the country. And hey, we have Elizabeth here so the government can can help us along the way. Thanks and thank you to everyone who came out and uh, stay tuned for uh, more um, Holding Hope Connect series to come in the new year. And if you know any of any family who needs help, um, people are dying, people are dying every day. If you need of any family who needs help, point them to our heal, uh, um, Healing Heart programs. We also have an Indigenous liaison that joined us and we're hoping to develop more Healing Heart groups in Indigenous communities um, and families who have loved ones, they're supporting, lovingly supporting. Um, check out our Holding Hope programs. Uh, we, are, we are here to help and, and thank you again for joining and, and good night to you all across the country. Thank you, good night everyone.